All right, everybody. So this is a been a long time actually since I've done an interview. I got Peter Rogers, MD, today uh, with me. He's got uh, a prepared lecture. I get, is it you, you got like a screen? Yeah, I got a lecture on uh, Dr. McDougal. Okay, perfect. So I don't really think I need to introduce you because you've been on here like this is like probably the fifth time. But uh, anyway, welcome back to the channel. Thank you. So what exactly did you want to talk about with uh, McDougal? Well, I can talk about a couple things with Dr. McDougal. Um, I just recently wrote a book. It just came out like uh, yesterday uh, about Dr. McDougal. I went through all his videos on his on his YouTube channel. I went through um, his newsletters and I've read like six of his books. So I summarized it all into um, into a book, kind of a, a oh, compilation. Wow. It's almost like a filing system of his work. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, let's just get started. Okay, so this is uh, one of Dr. McDougall's best books. It's called Digestive Tune-Up, and it goes through, you know, from the mouth to the butt, uh, pretty much everything in the digestive system is a good book. Um, and the other point I make is McDougall was a pretty healthy guy. Despite having a stroke when he was 18 years old, he, and he had some le residual left side of weakness. He was still a relatively robust, healthy guy, okay? It wasn't like he was, you know, uh, in the spinal cord unit or something. All right, here's his start solution, probably his best book, his most famous book. And that line comes from the patient asks, you know, is there any chance I'll ever be healthy again? Is there anything I can do? And McDougall says, starch is the solution to your health problems. He recommended that people eat a 90% of their calories from starch, 5% from um, fruits, 5% from vegetables, approximately. Not, not to measure, it, just approximate, a ballpark it. Okay, here's the book I just wrote. It just came out yesterday. It's called John McDougall, The Doctor Who Fought for You, uh, The Greatest Doctor Who Ever Lived. Um, and, you know, why do I say he's the best doctor who ever lived? Because he's cured more patients than anybody else. Um, if you look at Kempner, Kempner saw about 19,000 patients with the rice diet in the Durham, North Carolina, Duke. But McDougall only saw 12,000 patients in his clinical setting. But he, he helped so many patients through his newsletter, through his YouTube videos. And through his books that he ended up actually helping a lot more patients than Kempner did. Kempner was relatively reclusive. I like this painting. It's called Godspeed. It's by Edmund Layton. He's one of the students of the pre-Raphaelites in the Victorian Renaissance in England, sort of the Catholic revival time as well. And uh, anyways, it's called Godspeed. And it reminds me of Dr. McDougall and his wife, Mary. Um, you know, McDougall knew the literature uh, of uh, health, internal medicine better than anybody else. Um, his basic diet, like I said, it's 90% starch, 5% fruits and vegetables with no oils allowed. You know, it's whole foods, um, low fat. Okay. So, all right, then here is yeah, I get the, the slide. So it's a little tricky for me how to do it. Let me go back up. All right. So next slide is how did I write the book? Basically, I just made a mind map about all the things I had to cover, go through the newsletters, go through his books, go through his videos, and then organize it. So that's what I did. It's available also in uh, paperback and in um, audio book and in uh, ebook. Okay. So who was Dr. McDougal? There's he, when he was a young guy, he was working as a surgical uh, nurse assistant and he met Mary who was a regular surgical nurse and uh, they got married. Um, his having a stroke when he was 18 years old and transient left-sided hemiplegia motivated him to want to become a doctor. That's his big uh, driving thing. He came from Michigan uh, here's him when he got married uh, to Mary back in the like around 1960. Uh, in the 1960s, he was born I think in 1947. Here they are at about 70 years of age, so a very nice couple, and they're able to make it work all the way into their 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 entire lives till death yeah. do us part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's a good quote from Second Timothy chapter four verse seven: "I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith." Uh, McDougall, you know, why do I say he's a doctor to fought for you? Because he did a lot of stuff that was not in his own financial interest. You know, in medicine, you're rewarded from being conformist. Do whatever the standard of care is, do whatever the hierarchy wants you to do, you know, and just sell as many drugs as possible. See as many patients as possible. Crank out the billing codes as fast as you can. Match the ill to the pill and send the bill. McDougal was doing stuff like he tried to get the insurance companies to pay for you know, teaching the vegan diet, uh, low-fat vegan diet, uh, cardiac patients, coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis patients. Insurance companies refused to fund it. 
they pay about $30,000 for a coronary artery stent, about $150,000 for open heart surgery, cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft. And McDougal's like, you could just charge, you know, 1,000 to 4,000 for teaching the vegan diet. Why won't you do it? And he finally found out that the insurance company is in on it too. What I mean by that is the more the patient gets charged for their cardiac care, the higher the premiums go and the more money the insurance companies make. So basically the big drug companies, the big device manufacturers for surgery, the big device manufacturers for imaging, for lab tests and pathology, and for insurance, they all want to charge the patient as much as possible. So the entire system makes more money the more you provide more services and do more stuff to the patient. Versus if you empower the patient, you teach them you know, how to take care of themselves, uh, then, then they don't need you. They, they don't need to take any pills. So the old saying is if you cure a customer, if you cure a patient, you lose a customer. So that's why uh, almost zero progress has been made in clinical medicine in over 50 mm-hmm. years. And people go, oh, no, there's been progress. No, let me tell you something. There's been progress in the machines, like the CAT scan machines are better. The MRI machines are better than they used to be. But it's kind of like whoop de doo The patients are fatter and sicker than ever before, and there's no hope in sight of any improvement. I don't think there's ever going to be an improvement because – there's no incentive to improve. You know, there's an incentive to put on a show, but there's no incentive to actually help the patient. You just follow the standard of care, whatever happens, happens. And who do you think writes the standard of care? You know, the big name universities, the Ivy League places, and how do they write it? Well, the professor has to kiss butt to the big drug company, otherwise they don't get any funding. You piss off the drug company, they'll get you fired. So the drug company writes the standard of care in, in effect. Um, and that's why doctors aren't trained in what I call NETs. Nutrition, epidemiology, toxicology, you know, things like stress management, spirituality and all that stuff, the things that actually make a person get better, they're not trained in it and they don't pay any attention to it. It's not in their interest to do so. Um, They actually, the doctors like the patients, they want to help them, but, you know, if they follow the standard of care, number one, it's fast. Number two, they make a lot of money. Number three, they can't get in trouble. It doesn't matter if the patient dies. As long as you follow the standard of care, it doesn't matter what happens to the patient. So there's no incentive to do anything different. So what I'm trying to say is the fact that McDougal basically said, screw the standard of care. I'm just going to teach these poor people, you know, how to take care of themselves. Mm-hmm. That totally goes against his financial interest completely. Um, at his hospital where he works, St. Helena's, they wouldn't send him a single patient. He got zero referrals, zero. Okay. When he also, you know, got involved in politics, insisted that the lawmakers force the doctors to provide true informed consent with breast cancer, the fact that, you know, uh, mastectomy doesn't give an increased day of life and survival over lumpectomy. They, the doctors ran the insurance company system for malpral, malpractice insurance, and they they rejected his malpral. They they he he couldn't have any malpral. They tried to bankrupt him. They tried to to prevent him from practicing medicine. So he had to practice medicine for um, two years with no malpral insurance. That's a very scary thing for a doctor to do. He wow. could have easily been bankrupted by that. Um, it's called going bare, and he just you know paid out of pocket for some BS insurance. He was not insured. Uh, in his entire career, he was a doctor for like, I don't know, about 50 years. He never once was sued. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. And then here, take a look at what Wikipedia does. Wikipedia, do you think they're going to give him some compliments? No. They say his Dr. McDougall's recommendations are considered extreme. They are not supported by evidence. He, he uh, recommends a low-fat fad diet that is boring, leads to feelings of deprivation, the high fiber content can cause flatulence, it can possibly interfere with mineral absorption. This is all BS. The guy's the best doctor who ever lived. This is absolute nonsense. And they say he's been described as vegan vegetarian extremism. He's a vegan zealot. He takes his diet to the extremes. His concepts are extreme and out of keeping with nutritional reality. They say all this stuff because they know the average person, you know, has got a herbivore physiology. They've also got herbivore mentality. They want to stay in the middle of the pack. So it's frightening to the average, you know, low IQ person. Something extreme? Oh, my goodness, I must stay away from that. And mm-hmm. they say also could potentially lead to inadequate amount of dairy products, could cause osteoporosis. The opposite is the truth. Dairy actually causes osteoporosis. And the patients who follow his diet might not obtain enough protein. So oh, Wikipedia is totally thing. Yeah, they completely so slander the hearing about protein. And then they'll they'll start pushing the carnivore diet and like that's not an extreme diet. I, I it's, it's a whole thing that you know I actually um got approached by somebody that had 
a way of allocating like trillions of dollars towards this. And McDougal just kept turning me down. It was driving me nuts. I'm like, all we, all, all they wanted was like some backing from McDougal and he refused to do it. Yeah. He won't sell out his legacy. There's a lot of, there's a lot of famous nutrition people. I'm not going to say any names, but there's a lot of famous nutrition people who really sold out. They sold out the public. It they was, tell the it public. Wasn't, it wasn't to sell out. It was just to get the evidence that he had built over the 40 or 50 years that he had been doing it. Yeah. I, th I think, you know, Pritikin did a good job of writing about this too. And McDougal points out, for example, human breast milk has five to 6% of calories from protein. Okay. The baby's, you know, baby's birth first year of life. That's the most rapid time of growth ever. And if you only need 5% of your calories from protein, then you're going to need significantly less the rest of your life. And Pritikin had gone through the literature on it as well. There were some times where they fed people 2.5% of calories from protein. The people did really well. And it's basically impossible to be too low in protein with any naturally chosen diet. You look at sweet potatoes, which I think is about the lowest percentage of calories from protein in any of the starches. Um, and it has four and a half percent of its calories from uh, protein. So even if you ate only sweet potatoes, you still would have four and a half percent of your calories from protein. You probably only need about two and a half or three. I'd say probably about two and a half. I mean, I don't know the exact number, but it would make sense. It's about two and a half percent of your calories. So it's impossible. Dr. McDougall said it. There's no such thing in a person who's not, you know, starving to death, who's, who's deficient in protein. It just doesn't happen. You know, rice is about seven or eight percent of calories from protein, uh, regular potatoes are about eight or nine percent of calories from protein. Beans are twenty-five to thirty-five percent of their calories from protein. So it's essentially impossible to be too low on protein. So the whole thing is a bunch of nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I like the way they slander. Wikipedia is not like some objective information source. No, it's a very biased source yeah. of information that promotes its agendas, largely corporate, I would say. Um, so and also I mean, they're all owned by the same company, basically. It, it, the whole thing's getting ridiculous. Right. There's basically what I would call the opinion of big money. And what big money wants is its monopoly corporations to dominate everything and everybody to just, you know, take it and accept it. And they don't want any uh, disputing uh, opinion. Um, I'd also say there's a lot of people who didn't like Dr. McDougal because, you know, he was sort of, <clears throat> he spoke out for the little guy versus big industry. You know, he's criticizing big food, processed food, meat, dairy, pharma, the cancer industry, the medical insurance companies, the whole diabetic hypertension, all this stuff. So, you know, that's not going to make him too popular. And he would interview people like this guy. This is Gochki, the guy from the Cochrane Collaboration, who basically said mammography, screening mammography should not be performed. It mm -hmm. harms patients. Um, and he's the best expert in the world on mammography. Um, he also said psychiatry should be banned as a field. He says the whole field of psychiatry hurts far more people than it helps. That's true. Oh, yeah. It's, oh my gosh. You, everybody that goes there doesn't ever leave. They never right. get up. It's Hotel California. They put you on a bullshit medicine that causes a slow lobotomy. It was kind of yeah. funny, you know, the Prozac was like the most famous antidepressant ever, the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. And there was all this, you know, irrational exuberance about it back in the 1990s. And nowadays there's articles. You can look this up in five seconds, type it into your browser, just type in Prozac for chemotherapy. It is so toxic. They are now recommending it for chemotherapy. <laughs> you know, and its name is fluoxetine. The flu means fluoride, okay? Fluoride's a major brain poison. <laughs> And it kills your thyroid too. Yeah, it, it's 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 toxic. Okay, it's it's a harmful thing. Uh, it's it's all BS. Oh, so what all is, so the way it works is you get this Ivy League doctor, okay, and they and they're a junior professor. They want to get promoted to full professor. They want grant money for their research. So basically, who's got the money? Big Pharma's got the money. So they have to go to Big Pharma begging for money. And Big Pharma says, "Look, you promote our drug, we'll give you money." If you uh, don't promote our drug, you get nothing. And if you piss us off and make fun of our drug, we, we will fire you. We'll get you fired. We'll pay your university and they will fire you. So basically, the Ivy Leagues are a bunch of liars and a bunch of mm. sellouts because they have to do that if they want to get promoted and, you know, they want to make money. So that's why the, the big name universities have completely sold out the American public. They are not your friend. They're the enemy of you. I'm, I'm just telling you, you, you should know that. 
Because the average chump walks into a medical center thinking, oh, all this high technology and money is designed to help me. No, it's designed to rip you off. Um, there are, of course, some good things in medicine, especially it's good with emergency care. It's good with some surgical procedures and it's good with some other stuff too. But I, I'm letting you know, it has zero, like one of the reasons, like why are the parents, mother and father, the two best people in the world for a child? Because they love the child. And that love is more powerful than all this high tech BS. Uh, because what high tech loves what the modern medical system loves is money. And if the money goes against the patient's interest, well, too bad for the patient. Patients have no money. There's really nothing a patient can do. What can a patient do for a doctor? They say, thank you. They don't even really pay the doctor. Their insurance pays the doctor. They don't really pay the doctor. So what I'm trying to say is the doctor, you know, if you're lucky enough to have somebody care about you, that's good. But it's a, it's a giant mistake to think that they, what happens to you really matters to the doctor or the medical system. It doesn't. Um, and that's another reason why I've talked about it before in other lectures that, you know, there should be ethics. Like uh, Voltaire had said, I want my doctor and my tailor to believe in God so that they don't rob me. And it's like the other joke. Yeah. What's the difference between a lawyer and a doctor? I don't know. A lawyer will rob you. A doctor will rob you and kill you. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a dangerous thing. Here's Don Quixote in his library and he's getting all carried away when he's reading about the knights and damsels and chivalry. Um, and so this reminds me a little bit about McDougal getting all feisty and revved up about realizing that the medical books, I can tell you all the medical books are fake. All they do is recommend drugs. They don't mention any, any of the famous nutrition experts. They don't mention any of the, the nutrition information about these diseases. So the way to love anything is to realize it may be lost. And this reminded me of McDougal making his speech that he wasn't going to be a regular doctor. He's going to be a nutrition doctor. His residency director told him he was an idiot, that he was going to starve that he wouldn't get any patients or he would just get, you know, drug addicts and hippies and pot smokers. And he said, I don't think so. He said, I think there's going to be people who really want to maintain their health and they're going to be motivated and they're going to come for my advice and I'll do the best I can. So that was where he made his break from traditional medicine, right when he's a young guy, first year out of residency. Um, and then, like I said, this reminded me kind of uh, like Doug Lyle is a psychologist, a friend of his, and how McDougal would get himself into these big, you know, battles, if you will, with, you know, the insurance companies with the med mail pro system, et cetera. <clears throat> and they would tell him, you know, you don't really want to piss off all these powerful people, piss off all the cardiothoracic surgeons. You know, he went around saying cardiothoracic surgery is a joke. Okay. So they don't like him. That's why he never got any patients though. He got zero referrals. The doctors would come to him themselves. They would send their family to him, but they wouldn't want regular patients to go to him. I can tell you, I have a something, a little bit of a similar experience. Lots of doctors come and ask me about advice about themselves and their families, but they never invite me to speak publicly because, you know, it looks bad. You know, what do you mean? You're going to come in here and tell us nutrition is the way to go instead of selling our drugs, you know, get out of here. We don't make any money with that. Mm. Um, so this is a uh, Don Quixote when he goes up against the windmill, you know, a hopeless battle. Uh, I like this picture. It kind of reminds me, this is the hero's journey of Joseph Campbell. Um, the idea that, you know, the, 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 so the hero sort of tossed out of his regular world he hits the gutter and then he tries to climb back out of it. And every time he comes up two steps, he gets knocked back down one. And that's kind of what it's like when you try mm -hmm. to do something good and new. You, you don't quite often get much help, if any, and you're constantly getting knocked back down. But, you know, McDougal, he kept fighting all these years. You know, the, he was on TV, but then he got fired from TV. He got fired from the radio because he refused to recommend supplements that he didn't think were good. So they fired him. And uh, here he is, you know, he was... He wasn't promote. He wouldn't promote the supplements they wanted. Fired, um, and then somehow his house and his library was burned down. No, I don't know what happened with this, but you know, could it have been something? You know, like in Hawaii, I don't know what happened to it. Okay, but you know, all I can tell you is this: I look at these people that are promoting all this bogus commercial products. They've got sponsors, millions of views, and stuff. Oh, and all of them, and half of yeah. them are chiropractors. Like, how how are we listen to these chiropractors on this stuff? The one thinks that uh, he's uh, he is God. That, you know, did you see uh, what's his name Berg? I think he he says that he, he's he's he created humans. <laughs> he said he's part of a group that created humans. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of sad, but that's 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 the way the 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 system works nowadays. If you lie to the proles, you lie to the people, and you you tell them a bunch of BS, and you sell them a bunch of junk. 
you get sponsored, you get promoted, you get big money, you get your ticket to, to you know, a better life, if you will. If you tell them the truth, you get nothing and maybe even a little bit shadow, you know what band. OK, mm. so it is what it is, you know, so you have to. That's why I say people have to have an ethical foundation, because if they don't have an ethical foundation, then they're all going to sell out. Um, and so, like, for example, imagine you ran a hospital and if you um, do open heart surgery on a patient, you get 150,000 bucks. You put in a stent, you get at least $30,000. You teach them the vegan diet, you get $1,000. You have to put the patient at the top of the value system of what you care about most. Otherwise, it makes no sense to do anything else but open heart surgery or stents. You know, so that's what I'm trying to say. You have to have that ethical foundation because a lot of time people, times people tell me, oh, I'm a jerk or I'm full of crap because I, I emphasize this ethical foundation. Like I actually recommend a biblical worldview. I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. And I say that, you know, man created an image of God, therefore part divine. Therefore, he's entitled to, you know, the highest treatment. Like Jesus Christ who said that what you do to the least of my brother, you're doing to me. The reason I say that is I've been a doctor over 30 years and I see endless BS every day. Look at pediatrics with attention deficit, a BS diagnosis, and they treat them with amphetamines. It would be against the law to sell amphetamines to a, to a kid, to anybody on the street corner, but yet they're prescribed all day long to kids who end up very often becoming psych patients on a bunch of pills. They cause brain damage. Come on. It's a stimulant. Okay, It's an excitotoxin. Anyways, yeah. so what I'm trying to say is if you, if you went up to the average person and said, look, I'll give you 100 bucks where you poison this kid. They would say, no, I, I would not do that. And you say, well, I'll give you $1,000. And I can tell you, the average person would not poison a child for $1,000, all right? They just say, no, that's wrong. I would not do it. Mm -hmm. But the doctors do it all day long, every day. They think nothing of it. The school teachers send the kid to the school nurse and say, this kid needs meds for attention deficit. They poison children all day long, every day. Think about that. That's, that's the current standard of practice in medicine. Psychiatrists who've studied it, it's obvious to anybody who studies it. Look, read the book by Whitaker. It's obvious these children are being poisoned, okay? And it happens to adults, and it happens all over the place. But everybody just turns away and says, oh, well, it's a standard of care. The standard of care, yeah, the poison people, it's a disgrace. Okay, yeah, anyways. I remember, I remember watching that stuff come out, because it was coming out in the 80s when I was growing up. And a lot of my friends were being put on it, and they were doing some really weird stuff afterwards. Like, their parents were smart enough to pull them all off, but it was it was hard to watch. Yeah, a lot of I think the incidence of uh, suicide was worse with these drugs. A lot of these drugs, okay, yeah. and all kinds of bad things happened. Tons of bad stuff happened, and you know, and that whole thing about one drug, one neurotransmitter—that's all BS. Neurons are more like a symphony. You can't just change one little thing without having a whole bunch of compensatory changes that are unpredictable. So, uh, I just show this. These are McDougal Star McDougalers, people who uh, you know followed his diet and had tremendously wonderful results. And the, the point of showing it is, you know, he's got hundreds and hundreds of these patients, thousands of them, whereas in regular medicine, the cure rate for hypertension, diabetes, obesity, uh, autoimmune disease with drugs is zero, zero. The patient's never cured. They always have to take medicines versus low-fat vegan, you cure these diseases most of the time. Uh, McDougal worked initially after his internship in Hawaii, and he was working on a plantation plus in the city. And what he saw happen, and there'd be these old Filipino guys, they would retire at 65 years of age, they'd have some money saved up, they would go back to the Philippines, and they would get a bride who was less than half their age, let's say 25 years old, mm -hmm. they would raise a family with no, Vi no Viagra, and they would tend to die in their late 80s, around early 90s, uh, they were doing great, and he said, meanwhile, so these are the poor manual laborers from the sugarcane fields, whereas the wealthy people in the city, they're all fat, diabetic, hypertensive, coronary artery disease, cancer, dead prematurely. So I can tell you the average person I see 60 years and up, almost always they're fat, sick, and stupid. They've got hypertension, diabetes, mild cognitive impairment. I just expect that. Like if you told me this patient is 60 years old, I'm 60, by the way, I have zero medical problems. I don't take any pills. I can concentrate 12 hours in a row just fine. I do it all the time every day. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is, if you eat the Western diet, a high fat diet with vegetable oils and stuff, you're going to plug up your arteries and you're going to be sick. There's, there's no way around it. OK, I mean, it's rare. Like uh, doctors, if you talk to doctors for them to say, well, that patient was really with it. What they are saying is that the vast majority of their patients are not really with it. You know, they can still find their way home, but they've lost their nuance, their vitality, their spontaneity. 
Um, okay, so you know he went and he studied a lot in the library, and he kept on finding over and over again the same thing. You know, basically the low-fat vegan diet based on starch is the you know the species-specific diet to optimize human health. And he saw these old families, like the Asian families, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Philippines. The old timers, the grandparents were eating a rice diet their whole life. They're all skinny and relatively healthy. Their children are fatter, and then their grandchildren are much fatter and sicker. Um, oh, I, I made up this rhyme. It's basically for what McDougall's saying. Starch is what you do. Epidemiology is how you know it's true. Basically, you know, it's a pretty big sample set of China. A billion, a billion out of a billion rice eaters are skinny. You know, they used to eat around 90% of their calories from white rice. And you just eat a little bit of fruits and vegetables so you don't get berry-berry vitamin deficiency. You're fine. And the same thing happens with potatoes, with corn, with uh, sweet potatoes. Like Papua New Guinea, they eat 93% of their calories from sweet potatoes. Oh, God. Okay, McDougal points out. I would, I would get out. so sick of eating. Well, I mean, you know, when you, let's say with your rice. You mix it with a little bit of beans, mix it with some potatoes. It's enough variety just doing that. Um, all the all the large healthy populations have been starch based. There's no exceptions. Um, a, a typical example is look at the you know the Mexican American border by Arizona. These populations used to be mixed together: Tarahumara and the Pima. Um, the Pima after Mexican American War 1848 were absorbed into Arizona. The Tarahumara stayed in northern Mexico in the Sierra Madre Mountains. Sierra means like a saw, the up and down mountain ranges look like a saw. And it's also called Copper Canyon area. Anyways, these guys can run 100 miles in two days. They're super fit. Yeah. Nathan Pritikin patterned his diet after them. Oh, uh, with, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And the, the Pima, they eat the sad diet. They're all fat and sick, you know, even more sick than the average American. And they end up with all these train tracks all over themselves from surgery, diverticulitis, get a sigmoid resection, appendicitis, gallbladder, cholecystectomy for acute cholecystitis, open heart surgery, cabbage, coronary, bypass graft, pacemaker, thyroidectomy. They're totally sick, getting their legs amputated for diabetes. They're a disaster. And, you know, all this, this stuff is so common. In American medicine, all this stuff is just taken for granted. You wouldn't think twice. If you saw a patient that had all these scars, eh, typical old person, you know, yep. and they're on 20 pills, oh, typical old person. And meanwhile, Tata Hamada is running 100 miles in two days. You know, I'd rather, I will do whatever these guys do. I don't want to do what these guys are doing. Uh, yeah. Here's why starch is the best food in the world. Basically, it's a polymer of glucose, a whole bunch of glucose molecules stuck together, and then it's wrapped in fiber. So what happens is it's low caloric density. So it, has, it stretches the stomach because of its low caloric density. It's about a fourth as dense as, let's say, uh, sugar. Okay, and it, it stretches the stomach. And because of that, they get early satisfaction of hunger. Then the starch has to travel through the small intestine. As it travels through the small intestine, the enzymes gradually separate the fiber from the glucose, and the glucose is gradually absorbed into the blood. So you get a slow uprise in glucose, and then it gradually comes back down. Your blood glucose stays in the normal range a prolonged amount of time, so one satisfies hunger with the least number of calories. Um, and that, that makes you skinny. You're satisfying your hunger with the fewest number of calories, and all these other nutrients come in there too. It's packaged with, you know, your vitamins and minerals and your fiber, so you're good to go. If you were to eat just simple sugars, there's a tendency to get rebound hypoglycemia, whereby the lack of fiber um, causes the blood glucose level to spike rapidly. Pancreas tends to overcompensate is because there's not really much simple sugars in nature, and it anticipates getting more and more sugar, but it's usually a transient bolus, such that you get a transient spike, and then you because too much insulin gets secreted quite often the blood glucose levels then driven down rather rapidly. That's called rebound from this peak, rebound hypoglycemia. And that can be quite symptomatic and the person doesn't feel good. They'll often eat something, some more simple sugars, some sugars, sweets, and they keep going up and down all day like a roller coaster. That's another thing that makes people fat. What about uh, fruit? Fruit, I think fruit is better than, I actually disagree a little bit with Dr. McDougall about fruit. He yeah. says that fruit does not satisfy hunger very well and that people should only eat about 5% at the most 10%, but closer to 5% of their calories from fruit. Um, because it doesn't cause as big of a, a spike in glucose, it doesn't raise insulin as much, even if it might have a lower glycemic index in some cases, he says it doesn't satisfy hunger very well. He says people tend to overeat fruit and it can make them fat. 
Now, I realize that he says that, and I think it has to do with the fact, too, that he's mostly dealing with older people with a lot of comorbidity. They're fat, they're old, and they got a lot of disease, and they don't exercise much. On the other hand, all you got to do is click on the internet and start watching videos, and you're going to see one either young adult or early middle-aged to middle-aged person, and they're eating tons of fruit, and they're skinny. And fruit itself has a pretty low caloric density. But, but it is true, you can easily overeat fruit. Like I, I stopped eating apples because I would find myself eating 12 yeah, or 15 said, at a time. Yeah, you said that. I don't know. I, I, the only reason I bring this up is because I lost the majority of my weight on fruit. And even today, I've, I had uh, half a watermelon like four hours ago, and I'm still not hungry. Yeah, I personally, I eat about 35% of my calories from fruit. And I feel good. My weight's good. So I think that fruit is better than he gives it credit for. But I think the reason he goes down that path is he's dealing with older people that are sicker and don't exercise. Uh, Because, you know, I actually think the reason we have color vision is so we can see when fruits are ripe. You know, yeah, these carnivore animals don't have it. Um, you know, in nature, fruits can be seasonal. You know, where did we really arise from? I don't know. It's not clear. There's different theories. The so-called out of Africa theory is not the only one. And there's some good evidence for the other ones. So I don't know for certain. Um, and fruit, you know, fruit's got other issues with it. It tends to be expensive. It can be seasonal. So all that stuff. And nowadays they're, they're putting this AP, you know what, I think EEL mm-hmm. stuff on avocados, a lot on apples and who knows what else. Yeah. Um, okay. Here's Dennis Burkett. Uh, he was an Irish guy. He was a Christian missionary to Africa. He'd been trained in a surgical residency in England. And then he did his, uh, his missionary work in Uganda, Africa. And he made some big discoveries. He, he sort of mapped out a pattern of occurrence for a lymphoma that got called Burkitt's lymphoma. And they put him in charge of epidemiology for Africa. Where he, so he sort of monitored like over a thousand hospitals and people would send him information, he would study it, and he came up with abdominal pressure syndrome. Anyways, his only in-person interview on the internet is the one he did with McDougal. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, you it's know, good stuff. Actually, I was gonna actually re-review that because the other day, I don't know if you know who uh, John Kohler is, he's a juicer, like a discount juicer guy. And he was interviewing this woman from Sweden who uh, had gotten cancer and she immediately started juice fasting. And I'm like, I bet you that, cause she couldn't get rid of the cancer. She had to go on chemo. And I bet you it's because of having no fiber. Because the one thing that Dennis Burkett found was that these people weren't getting diseases because they had so much fiber in their diet and they kept the colon clean. Yeah, his patients were amazingly healthy. They almost never had a colon cancer, you know, almost no colon polyps. Yeah, but they, had, they, they say the cancer starts in the intestine. And if it's cleaned out, there's nowhere for it to start. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, they've had their colon uh, polyps regress, go back to normal when they become low-fat vegans. Um, Dr. Pritikin, he said that people should eat about – a, you know, a minimum of around 50 grams of fiber a day, but he said it's normal for us to eat 100 or more grams of fiber per day. Yeah. And there's all kinds of good things happen from that. The bacteria in the colon, they take that that fiber and they use it to make short chain fatty acids, especially butyrate that's used by the intestinal lining cells, the enterocytes, to make tight junctions, you know, the butyrate in particular. And so if you don't have that butyrate, then you get loose junctions, you get increased intestinal permeability, that's leaky gut. And then you go down this whole path of autoimmune disease, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's colitis. Plus, you also get a type of clotting called amyloidogenic clotting. So it makes your blood prothrombotic, and that increases your risk of a heart attack and a stroke. I actually think that's way more common than, than is widely realized that, you know, blood becoming hypercoagulable due to leaky gut. Uh, here's Nathan Pritikin. He also has a, a nice interview with Dr. Um, McDougal on the internet. And Pritikin said some interesting things. He said the most useful way to distinguish the different types of diet is by the amount of fat. And he studied all the fat. It's in that legacy book. This is the legacy book of Pritikin that's on Dr. McDougal's uh, website, drmcdougal.com. And um, he says fat causes lipotoxicity. Fat is bad. 
And he went through all this detail about why he thinks fat is basically a disaster for health. And it's impossible. Him and McDougal both agree. It's impossible to be too low in dietary fat. I personally think all this stuff about good fats is nonsense. Um, because I've seen papers where people ate only like 1% of their calories from fat, 0.75% of their calories from fat, and they did really well. Okay, now this is a paper about how vegans are kind of seen as outsiders in society. I can tell you, I've had several viewers tell me I should stop calling myself a vegan, that once you get outside of the plant-based community, you say the word vegan and people think you're crazy. They think vegans are weirdos, they're strange. Um, and I kind of laughingly said, this reminds me of something about Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Malcolm X said that he was a field Negro, that he would never be accepted by polite society. And so what I'm kind of joking here is that the vegans in general are not accepted by society, but the low fat vegans especially are a very small group. And so they remind me of Malcolm X's category that would never be accepted. The field Negroes put far out on the plantation, far from the house, whereas the house Negroes are sort of tolerated by the establishment much more so. And as I say, the house Negroes in this, in this metaphor are like the moderate fat vegans, the ones who recommend soy and olive oil and canola oil and omega-3 oils, fish oil, algae oil, all this stuff. Um, so the way I would categorize some of the diets here is the most austere diet would be the Walter Kempner rice diet. Okay. He's used Uncle Ben's white rice. All right. Then there's also really austere ones that are raw vegans, and they sometimes say raw is the law. And this marathon or runner guy, Michael Arnstein, is kind of famous for that. Ruth Heydrich ended up down that path. She started out on the McDougal diet. There's the whole durian rider, free Rita, free Lita banana girl, raw till four stuff they used to talk about. Uh, anyways, these are some of the very austere versions. My version, I call it the Spartan vegan diet, the medical monk diet or whatever. And I'm pretty careful that I won't eat anything that's processed at all. Um, I always filter my water, that sort of thing, no caffeine. And I'm a little bit obsessive, compulsive, careful about a few other things. So these diets, I think, are not realistic. That's why I jokingly call them the field Negroes of veganism, okay? They're not realistic, I think, for most people. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the McDougal diet, which I would say is more of a middle of the road in the vegan, in vegan land. And basically, he doesn't insist on organic. He does insist on no oil, no animal foods, okay? And then what I'm getting at is what I would say the most famous vegans are really this crowd right here. And I call them the, you know, the house Negroes in the sense that even though they're considered a little bit strange by mainstream society, they're still accepted by um, industry to some extent because they do sell stuff. They'll promote a lot of soy. They'll promote a lot of seeds. They promote nuts. They promote olive oil. They promote omega-3s. Um, they'll promote coffee and tea and they'll promote some supplements and all these other things. And I think all of that gets them accepted by the mainstream because they figure they can sell some. In a sense, they see them as the marketing tool to get to all these people. Um, and also for me saying this metaphor, this is why I got fired from the Chef AJ show. It's the truth, okay? I put Esselstyn as a little bit separate from the McDougal diet or from my way of looking at things because he emphasizes eating greens like six times a day for high risk cardiac patients as to provide nitrates that are precursors for making nitric oxide. Okay, I just then there's don't all agree with greens. I don't think we're supposed to be eating greens, honestly. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole big subject. Um, so I, I don't want to go into that, but I, I don't want to go into it either. But like, look at how many inhibitors are in greens. It's just, I, I stay away from them. Yeah, the one thing I worry about is there's some talk about spraying that stuff on them as well. The AP, you oh, know what? Yeah. EE e and then the L. Yeah, yeah, so I don't know how common that is. It's very hard to find out information on what's sprayed or not sprayed with that stuff. But I, I have heard them talking about putting that on salads and that concerned me, you know? Because basically, big money doesn't care at all about the proles. They could care less about us. They would actually prefer that there were less of us. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to figure out, you know, what type of food they're messing with, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sad about that. But I, it's not that easy to get that information on where it is. There are some grocery stores that don't, that don't use it at all. 
and they do advertise them. I think natural grocer was one of them and stuff, but mm -hmm. um, it takes a little while to sort that all out, but it's not an easy thing to figure out. And I've, I've done things like I've gone to these grocery stores and tried to talk to their produce manager. Their produce guys tend to not know anything. The guys who stack the shelves and stuff. And then I go and talk to the higher ups in the more central part of the store. And they usually say, Oh, you got to come when the buyer's here. The buyer only comes one day a week in the afternoon. You know, I got to work. I can't just sit around and try to talk to the buyer. And, mm -hmm. you know, anyways, it's, it's harder to figure that out than it should be. Other stores, grocery store chains, they'll say, Oh, we don't use APL on any of our stuff. But then you go to their, their website and they won't print it. So they're giving you a verbal, but they won't put it in writing on their site. Mm. So it, it can be difficult to tell. Um, then as far as the vegans, you know, there's some people who are for animals rights. You know, I want everybody to be nice to animals, but I don't go by that. A lot of the people who go by animals rights, they're a lot nicer to animals than they are to people from what I've seen. Um, lacto ovo pesco was a common thing amongst doctors, but and they end up being a little bit better off than the rest of this crowd by about five or 10 years, but they still get, you know, sick with the same diseases. Um, and then Mediterranean diet, I think is the most common trick in the sort of conventional medicine community to pretend, Oh, Mediterranean diet. It's a very good diet. You know, BS. It includes alcohol, meat, oils. It's a terrible diet. <laughs> it's for chumps. It's a way to trick people. And then all this low carb paleo carnivores for, double chumps. It's all, it's all a big joke. You know, there's four studies show on longevity with these diets and all was a paleo keto carnivore, low carb crowd. They always die sooner, have more coronary cardiovascular events. It's for chumps. You can get short-term weight loss with any diet just by willpower, but it's very difficult to sustain these diets. The lack of fibers associated with constipation, the ketosis is associated with feeling lousy and sick. They're, they're not a smart way to go. I mean, if you got refractory seizures, unresponsive to the medicine, and you don't want surgery, you can slow your brain down, okay? But I don't think that is a good idea. Uh, here's what happens when you eat dietary fiber. The good bacteria, they take the fiber and they convert it to short-chain fatty acids, two-carbon acetate, three-carbon propionate, four-carbon butyrate. And then the four-carbon butyrate in particular is taken by the enterocytes, the gut lining cells, epithelial cells, and they make it into tight junctions. And the tight junctions make sure that nothing that's nothing bad is able to get inside of your body. Okay. They form a strong barrier and that's what you want. This is also why I joke. There's no such thing as good fat. The fiber, you know, actually in your colon gets converted to short chain fatty acid. And other than, you know, some omega threes and some omega sixes in very, very small amounts, you don't really need any other fat than that. So fat's kind of a big joke. This good fat stuff is just a slogan to trick people into eating more dietary fat. There's a lot of other things that can damage the intestinal lining and cause leaky gut. I got a whole list of them here. Like if I had autoimmune disease or inflammatory bowel disease, I'd go through this list step by step and avoid every one of these things. Because if you get a leaky gut, meaning that you don't have these tight junctions, then bacterial toxins like LPS, lipopolysaccharide from the gram-negative bacteria, the equivalent thing from gram-positive bacteria would be LTA, LTA, lipotychoic acid. They can get Past this epithelial barrier, they can cause inflammation in your gut wall, Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, all that stuff. Big chunks of protein can get in your body and lead to autoimmune disease. Um, so this is part of the things that fiber protects us from. So Burkett was right that fiber protects us a lot. Um, also, these things get into the blood, LPS, LTA, and they cause uh, the predisposition to blood clotting, the fibrinogen, the blood clotting protein. They change its shape from being shaped like a slinky, that's called alpha helix secondary protein structure, to becoming beta pleated sheet flat, and it'll stack up like a deck of cards and form clots. And this is um, a type of clotting called amyloidogenic. Amyloidogenic just means, amyloid means a change from alpha helix shape, like a slinky, to mm. becoming flat, like beta pleated sheet. And it's actually a very big deal because in this one, you have individual molecules versus here, the different uh, components of fibrin, fibrinogen, they're all sticking together. The bigger a molecule gets an aqueous solution, water solution, which is what the human body is, the more likely it is to precipitate out a solution. So these cause a form of clots that are very bad. These are called dense matted deposits. There was a guy by the name of Douglas Kell with a lady named Etheresia Pretorius who worked out a lot of the mechanism for this stuff. And the point is these specific types of clot, dense matted deposits, Deposits are very refractory to lysis, meaning that normally in the blood, there's little clots forming, they get dissolved, little clots forming, they get dissolved. There's a lot of clot dissolving chemicals in our blood because you're not supposed to clot mm -hmm. um, unless there's an emergency, you know? 
And so what I'm trying to say is you make yourself prothrombotic and you increase your risk of plugging up arteries in useful areas in your brain, in your heart, et cetera. And it also turns out there's some viral proteins that do the same thing. I'm not going to go into the details on that, but these viral proteins will cause a change in the secondary structure of fibrinogen. That's the major clotting protein, fibrinogen. It gets This is sort of like a pre-protein, but then it'll lose the agen part and it just becomes fibrin and it will cause it to change shape from alpha helix like a cylinder into flat like a deck of cards, beta pleated sheets, stack up dense matter deposits. And I actually think this contributes to dementia, cognitive impairment by plugging up small arteries in the brain and also to something called microvascular angina, meaning that it's plugging up small arteries in the heart. So what I'm telling you, I'm, I'm trying to make this point. What this, th- this slide I told you right here, this is mm-hmm. a very important, very useful thing to know. This is, I think, leading a lot of people to be very sick and to die prematurely because they're not aware of this. Okay, in addition, free iron contributes to this. Men tend to become iron overloaded in their 20s because they don't menstruate and they tend to eat a lot of high iron foods in the, in the USA and the Western world, like red meat in particular. But they also started fortifying foods in like the 1970s with iron. And that was yeah. a very bad thing to do. Um, when I was young, I didn't know any better. I used to see Popeye the sailor man with his big biceps after eating spinach uh, because the spinach had a lot of iron in it. So I used to think, oh, I got to eat raisin bran because it had the highest iron level of any cereal I could find. Uh, like 25% of your daily need with one serving, I would eat the whole box. Okay. So anyways, I got my uh, blood serum ferritin, which is an indicator of your body's uh, free iron levels. And mine was in the normal range. It was like around 274 or something. Normal is like around 320 or something. But the reason I mention it is I started like donating blood. I didn't, I, I tried donating about half a unit and I got lightheaded because I wasn't hydrated first. So what I do now is when I go for blood labs, um, I just tell them pull off a couple extra tubes. I'll pull off like five small tubes and just throw them in a the garbage can. I do that because I'm gradually getting it down. Now my serum ferritin is about 110. The ideal serum ferritin is about 30 to 80. That's a number worth knowing. Like if somebody's having health problems and they're trying to get their act together, I would say that's one more thing you could do is get your serum ferritin down to about 30 to 80. Because mm. um, it'll decrease your risk of oxidative stress. Because when you have free iron in the blood, normally iron, the way you can think of iron is iron is like a fire in your house. Okay, you want a fire in the stove. It helps you to cook food. You yeah. want a fire in your water heater to heat the water, okay? You want a fire perhaps in your fireplace to warm your hands, but you don't want fire anywhere else or it destroys everything, okay? And when it's the same thing in the human body, iron is held within iron binding proteins and there's some enzymes that have iron in them, like you know the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane for electron transport because it has a variable valence. It's a transitional metal and having a variable valence, it can hand off electrons in the active site of an enzyme to facilitate a useful reaction. But if iron were to get free, as it sometimes does in our blood, it causes trouble. It can cycle back and forth between Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. That's called ferrous redox cycling. And in so doing, it can hand off electrons to passing oxygen molecules. And these oxygens then become what is called free radicals. They can initiate chain reactions, and they also initiate this process of amyloidogenic clotting with refractory small clots forming and then potentially becoming lodged in the capillaries and damaging tissues in our body over a gradual basis. Okay, so by getting your fiber, you pr- you prevent amyloidogenic clotting for through LPS and LTA. By not eating so much iron or by donating blood, you get your serum ferritin down and you're less likely to have a problem for that reason, okay? Maintain a strong immune system and you're less likely to have a virus infection that could also predispose you to this form of clotting, okay? This is a major problem. Trust me, if you study anything about clotting, why are people forming abnormal clots? You're going to come back to this and you're going to want to know what I'm just telling you. In addition, high fat diets, they kind of paralyze the immune system. There's a good lady. She's also Irish. Her name is Lydia Lynch. She has lectures from when she was at Harvard on the YouTube channel called Global Immunotalks. She's now moving her lab over to Princeton. But when she was at Harvard, she and Global Immunotalks, that's a YouTube channel, her lecture on immune system and uh, dietary lipid, okay? And what she found was that when you eat high-fat meals, you suppress your immune system. It essentially paralyzes your um, innate immune system, NK cells, and it paralyzes your cytotoxic T cells. So basically, the major cells that protect you, it prevents them from being able to function. 
Wow. So you don't want to be eating high fat diets. High fat diets, they screw you up in many ways. Not only do they cause atherosclerosis, not only do they cause obesity, they also cause diabetes and they also increase your risk of cancer because they make your tissues hypoxic. They stick the red blood cells together into what's called blood sludge or low formation. And so they cause tissue hypoxia. So they're bad. There's nothing good about it. Wow. Um, okay, here's McDougal with it. He got a tattoo on his chest. Do not cath or I will sue. Now, I don't know if he just Photoshopped this on for this picture. Yeah, I don't know. I, I would bet that he did, but it's still kind of funny. Um, when he fell down, he had a fracture and he wouldn't even go to the hospital because he's afraid they would force him to, to get a cardiac cath or sedate him or something and then take him for cardiac cath. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, because, you know, like I said, the, the, Stenting and uh, open heart surgery for coronary artery disease, they don't increase longevity at all. Um, they, they can reduce symptoms of cardiac angina, cardiac-related chest pain from coronary artery atherosclerosis, but they, they won't uh, make you live longer. The only time that stenting will make you live longer is if it's done in the emergency situation to treat a heart attack in progress and a myocardial infarction. You get to them before 90 minutes, and they can potentially reopen the coronary artery. So they can be helpful in that sense. And this is McDougall talking about his left-sided weakness. You can see his pectoralis muscles a little bit better developed on this side yeah. than on this side. Uh, but he still, you know, he was able to go windsurf and he was able to go hiking with his grandson on his backpack. Okay. He was a lot more robust than one would think. He had a pretty good recovery. He had what was called a lacunar infarction. So a lacunar infarction is just a small stroke, like right about here in the brain, um, in the basal ganglia. And, you know, people can often recover quite well from those as he did. You know, he had left sided weakness for like two weeks and then a little bit of residual left sided weakness the rest of his life. He was actually uh, temporarily like paralyzed on the left side of his body. But, you know, he made a good recovery from it. And I'm going to bet you he had what's called a dissection type of stroke. Because one of the things I do is I'm a neuroradiologist. I look at strokes all day long every day. Young people typically get what are called dissection strokes, and that's a transient injury to the artery causing a little bit of clot to form. The clot embolizes distally the brain, causes a stroke. Okay, but the relevance is that other than that, they're okay. It's not like an old person who's 70 years old with, you know, 20 different problems, and on top of it, they have a stroke, and they're terribly ill for 20 other reasons. No, he was otherwise healthy 18-year-old, probably dissected an artery, had a stroke, but he didn't have additional comorbidity. What I'm trying to say is, because people say, oh, well, it's a miracle he survived the 77, even though he had a stroke when he was 18. And what I'm saying is, I don't think it had anything to do with it. And I don't think it had anything to do with the fact that he was fat either, because there's tons and tons of fat teenagers. They never have a stroke. Yeah. Unless they have a dissection. Um, I got a couple of McDougal quotes just to go through some of them, because they're kind of fun to know. It's a good way to remember what he taught. You know, here's a, the standard question. Doc, will I ever be healthy again? And McDougal says, well, the solution to your health problem is starch. Starch is a solution for you on how to become healthy. So again, it's extraordinary. He recommends 90% of the calories. That's not a misstatement. 90% of his calories. I went over it carefully in his books and in his videos and his newsletter. I asked him about that in my interview with him, and he, he, he re-emphasized it. Yep. And it's kind of nice. Well, like I said, you won't hear any of the other famous nutrition people saying that. And he's basically telling you, here is the secret right here. Take it or leave it. Eat 90% of your calories from starch, okay? Um, and then 5% from fruits and vegetables. And, you know, here's your starches, rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, beans, peas, barley, millet, oats, wheat, quinoa, quinoa, it's hard for me to say, quinoa, uh, rye, sorghum, wheat, squash. Okay, if you only eat white rice, you could get beriberi, but it just takes a little bit of fruits and veggies. You could eat just about only potatoes. The only thing you're going to need is vitamin B12. You know, I myself, I take methylcobalamin. I would never take cyanocobalamin because I don't want that cyanol stuff accumulated in me. Um, and McDougall says, if you take just one point from his book, like a starch solution book, it would be eat more starch. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I'm the luckiest doctor in the world because my patients get well. Because he knows if you work on drug-based medicine as a vast majority, 99.999% of internists do, their patients never get cured. Never. No. It would be like a miracle for a patient to ever no. be cured of anything. Um. And that's why I joke, conventional medicine calls itself the gold standard of healthcare, but the joke is they're like a sports team. Imagine if you had a sports team and the cheerleaders, the cheerleaders cheer was, we always lose, we lose every game, we're the best. Yeah. Why is that considered the gold standard when low-fat vegan cures the patient? 
Okay, McDougall says fat is the major toxin in the Western diet. Fat paralyzes the insulin receptor and causes obesity. Um, and then we talked about all the other things it does too. Fat causes red blood cells to stick together. This is called blood sludge. And blood sludge is the main cause of hypertension. He actually thinks salt is not as big of a deal in hypertension. Anyways, him and Pritikin kind of see this in a similar way. Kempner sees it as a little different, that salt's a big deal. It's just a question of a threshold. You have to get it really low, low before it makes a difference. Anyways, the point I'm making is, so fat causes diabetes, causes obesity, causes hypertension. Those are the gateway diseases, atherosclerosis, which is why most people die. And high-fat meal decreases PaO2, the pressure arterial of oxygen, by 20%. So... You know, Warburg, out of Warburg, the Warburg effect says if you can drop oxygen delivery to tissues by 35%, you uh, can cause cells to transform into cancer. So it's a major cause of cancer. You know, and if you look at like the Japanese in the 1960s and 70s when they're smoking like chimneys and they're eating tons of sodium, about 12 to 14 grams a day. Despite the fact they smoked like chimneys, they had much, and same thing with Papua New Guinea, same situation. They had much, much, much lower lung cancer than Americans did. And it's thought it's because the Americans were also eating a high-fat diet, whereas uh, the Japanese and the Papua New Guinea were eating a very low-fat diet. Sweet potatoes, Papua New Guinea got 1% of calories from fat. White rice for the Japanese, 1% of calories from fat. And that protected them so they didn't get that much lung cancer despite smoking like chimneys. Um uh, oils are even worse than sat fat for causing blood cells, the red blood cells to stick together. What it really means is red blood cells have a negative charge on their outer surface called a zeta potential. And then uh, the chylomicrons, fat particles, and the LDL cholesterol, fat particles, they have a positive charge. So, And they're big enough in size, they can grab two RBCs and stick them together. That's called overcoming the zeta potential. So these are called bridging molecules. So basically, fat messes up everything. <laughs> um the best way to prevent or reverse atherosclerosis is reduce the amount of fat in the diet. All forms of dietary fat increase the risk of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. That includes omega-3s. I think omega-3s are bogus. This is, this is what McDougall says. He says omega-3s, there's plenty of them in low-fat plant foods. You don't need fish oil. You don't need supplements. They suppress the immune system. There's considerable evidence that fish fat, like for omega-3s, will increase a person's risk of cancer, prostate cancer in particular. They also increase the risk of metastases in animal studies. Uh, fish fats known to paralyze the action of insulin. This is the McDougal newsletter. Anybody wants to look it up? Here you go. McDougal newsletter, February, 2003, drmcdougal.com website. Okay. So the reason I mentioned this, there's a lot of people, some pretty famous ones trying to tell everybody, Oh, omega threes are so important and essential. Mm -hmm. That's actually BS. There's the short length, uh, just two double bonds or three double bonds. Um, omega-3s, omega-6s that are essential. Those are called the PEOs, the parent essential oils. All the other ones, like the bigger ones, you know, arachidonic acid in the omega-6 family or DHA and EPA in the omega-3 family, the body can make those when it needs them. And it doesn't need much. Because if you think about your brain, for example, we can remember stuff from when we were children, okay? And the relevance is that Brain cells don't turn over that much. The reason you can remember what happened when you were a kid is because your brain cell is still there. It's not like cells in other parts of the body, the intestinal lining, that are constantly turning over. So that's another reason why we don't need that much omega-3. Omega-3, why would you have some in your neurons? Because they help fluidize cell membranes. Omega-3s are also why women have big butts. Women have big butts because they store their omega-3s in their butts. Um, and their upper thighs. It's sort of an energy efficient area to carry them. That's also why women got little shoulders because, you know, our ancestors worried about starvation every day. So it would be a waste of energy to put big shoulders and muscles on a woman because typically the job of a woman is to have a baby and to take care of the baby until the kid hits puberty. When the kid hits puberty, then he goes with the men, the boy, to do whatever men do. And the girl stays with the women and do whatever women do. And I can remember that pretty clearly when I was um, in sixth grade. I was a pretty good wrestler. I won the village championship of wrestling, and I was kind of acting arrogant around the house. I don't know what I did, but I pissed off my mother, okay? My mother picked me up and threw me down on the bed or the couch or something and smacked me with the belt. And I'm like, wow, my mom could kick my ass. And then by the time I got in seventh grade, I gained like about 15 pounds. I was real strong, and I knew she couldn't beat me up at that time. Um, so that's kind of how I remembered that. But it's true. So, you know, they just want the woman to survive and the baby to survive. So they don't want her carrying extra weight on her shoulders. Okay. Um, 
if you go back to time, like let's say the Victorian age and the in the eighteen uh, hundreds, women would typically have about ten children. That was average. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so they're they're kind of ever since the beginning of time designed to do that. This modern idea of, oh, you're supposed to get a corporate job and only have one kid. That's a very oh, okay. modern thing. Yeah. That's Bullshit. not that's not history. <laughs> no. You know. And not the other thing. Too, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Too. And these women are convinced a lot of them. Oh, their job is the most wonderful thing in the world. You know what? The corporation will fire you in two seconds and not even remember your name. Okay? And you can and you see know, the misery on their faces too. Like it's just, they're not, it's, they're not built for it. Yeah. A woman is happy up until about 30 years of age at a job. Cause it's kind of fun. You know, first time you get a job, you make some new friends, you talk to each other. Maybe you go out on a weekend. It's kind of fun. Okay. But then all of a sudden you're in your thirties, your biological clock is ticking. Your girlfriend has a couple of babies. They've got a life. They're happy. The children are the joy of their life. And there's something going on with them. Okay. Whereas then the woman starts wanting a kid. Then by the time she's 40, maybe she will have had a kid. And then she's stuck having to work and she's kind of miserable. When I was a kid growing up, none of my friends' moms worked. Only one mom worked because she was divorced and they were poor. And then we would go over there, you know, to have a party or something because there's no adult in the house. Yeah. But, um, Everywhere else, all, all the other moms, none of them had to work. And that's why they talk about, oh, you've come a long way, baby. BS. The reason why women work nowadays is, number one, because they're poor. Number two, because they're brainwashed into thinking a job's more important than a baby until they get older, mm-hmm. older and they realize the truth. Nothing will make you, you know, 10% as happy as a family. Um, my mom stayed, after my mom had her first kid, she stayed home with the children. My mom was the happiest woman in the world I ever met my whole life. Yeah, um, my mom didn't work. Yeah, and the house ran well. You 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 have a house run by a woman, and she's she's home. Yeah, the place will run very well. Runs perfectly. Um, yeah, exactly. I wish I told my wife I wanted her to stay home. No, she had to work, and oh god, I don't even want to get into it. But we would have been a lot better off if she stayed home. Um, let's see here. Okay, so people ask, why am I so sick? Why are people so sick? And I tell them, this is McDougal quotes. Continue. It's the food. Uh, more important than anything else. More important than exercise, lifestyle, all that other stuff. You got to eat the right food. He says, in order to get the cure, you must stop the cause. He also said earlier, there is, it's impossible to be too low in protein. It's impossible to be too low in calcium. Okay. He thinks thyroid disease is caused by eating in the thyroid tissue of animals and having leaky gut and that protein getting into the blood causing an autoimmune reaction. So he thinks that's what causes autoimmune disease. Like things like hot dog is a basically a ground up animal. Thyroid mm-hmm. tissue is in there. And that leads to autoimmune reactions, whereby the animal protein thyroid is different enough than our bodily proteins that the immune system reacts to it, but similar enough that they still cross-react and destroy our own thyroid, like Hashimoto's thyroiditis or Grave's thyrotoxicosis, autoimmune diseases of the thyroid. Okay, um, The paleo, keto, low-carb, high-fat promoters have money on their side, but we, the low-fat, starch-based vegans, have the truth on our side. The truth does not change. Okay, people love to hear good news about their bad habits so they can keep eating the junk food. Um, And he says this keto diet reminds him of what P.T. Barnum had said. There's a sucker born every minute. The treadmill stress test is a conveyor belt to the cardiac cath lab and the operating room. The so-called widow maker coronary artery lesion is a sales pitch. They use that to trick patients into stents and surgery. Stents don't extend life, not at all. I have a tattoo on my chest that says do not cast. So anyways, uh, those are some uh, great Dr. McDougal quotes. And here's a picture of him giving a talk. He was a very good speaker, you know. Yeah, he, he was. was. The, yeah. Yeah, and you watch those videos, man, when he was in his 50s and in his 60s, he was an extraordinarily good speaker. Oh, and I was just showing, here's about his stroke. You know, a lacunar infarction, lacunar means whole. Typically, the basal ganglia is this deep part of the brain. And typically, a lacunar infarction is uh, either a hypertensive injury to one of these arteries. They're called lenticulostriate arteries, or it's an embolus, a piece of blood cloth from a neck dissection, probably, going into here and then trashing some arterial tissue, trashing some brain tissue. Okay, that's a stroke. The brain tissue dies. That's a stroke. But you can still get perfusion around it, and you could also get some compensatory uh adoption of the function by adjacent neurons so you can you can recover some function also after the initial injury if you reperfuse the tissue around it some of it's not truly dead it's just become dysfunctional it can start to function again so that's what's called a lacunar infarction and that's what he had a lacunar infarction in comparison to what you would call a cortical infarct cortex means like bark the bark of a tree the gray yeah. matter ribbon on the periphery of the brain is the cortex and when this gets infarcted, you'll be more likely to have a, a permanent deficit. 
So uh, here's a lacunar infarction. This little low density spot on a CAT scan, yeah. this high intensity spot on a brain MRI. This is a lacunar infarction in the basal ganglia. That's probably what McDougall had. But, you know, McDougall had his stroke in the 1960s. Back in those days, they didn't even have CAT scans. And they didn't get an MRI for a long time after that. So he didn't get a CAT scan or an MRI. They probably did um, a coronary, uh, uh, an arteriogram and injected the arteries. They probably just assumed he had a lacuna infarct. He might have gone back later and had a CAT scan or an MRI and they confirmed it. But, you know, I don't know. But anyways, I'm just telling you, strokes in this area, what he probably had, some type of basal ganglia lacuna infarction, patients often recover pretty well from that. Um, and here is this painting. It's actually the death of Don Quixote, but it can remind us of the death of McDougal. He kind of died suddenly for unexpected reasons. He had been healthy just a week before and given a video and was at his baseline. So, you know, we don't know exactly what happened to him. But um, anyways, that's a uh, that's the story of Dr. McDougal. All righty. I don't actually have any questions because I didn't know what you were going to talk about. So <laughs> is there anything else that you wanted to uh, to mention? Um. No, kind of this McDougal stuff has been on my mind the last couple of months. That was really the, the newest thing. You know, that's sort of the big event of the last couple of months. All right. So that was it, uh, everybody. Uh, you know, and, oh, the, the one thing that I do want to ask you, where do, where do you get the, where, do, where does somebody get your book? Oh, it's all, it's only at Amazon.com. Okay. Uh, um, send me a link to that and I'll, I'll put it down below so people can check that out. And anything else? Uh, I guess just post on in the comment section. We'll get to it then. And thanks for watching. Anyway, uh, like, subscribe, and we'll talk to you in the next one.